Between 1939 and 1945, World War II consumed the near total resources of the largest, most powerful nations on Earth. The costs were staggering beyond imagination. My family, when I was in the service, my wife and children actually ate horse meat. And I'm kind of glad to get it. <laughs> meat was hard to come by. It was rationed. Canned goods was rationed. Uh, you had to stand in line for, uh, if there was any butter, if there was any meat at all, it took rationing coupons. This way we bypassed the rationing lines and it fed our family, sometimes three times a week. And of course if you knew a grocer, you sometimes had an inside track and that was helpful. There was a shortage of cigarettes uh, at one point and I know I, I got to be very popular because my father had a drugstore on the main street here in Concord and uh, so I had access to cigarettes. So. Uh, I got quite popular in cases when there were cigarette shortages. Easter was coming up that Sunday, and uh, stockings were hard to come by. So the Levitt Company, Le Levitt Store in Manchester, was going to close at 5.30 and let their regular health go home. And then they were going to reopen, and uh, there would be stockings for sale. So I left my son with my mother-in-law, and I was down there at 4.30, and the line had already started. Well, the line probably went from here out to the street on Elm Street, and then it went up Manchester Street, and then it went into the back street and rounded out and down and around. So at 5.30, they opened the doors, and we went in, and they would ask you your size, and you got your one pair of stockings. There were no chocolate bunnies for Easter, no metal toys for Christmas, and no fireworks for the 4th of July. Inmates at the New Hampshire State Prison ate beans instead of meat and turned out license plates with black numerals because green paint was needed by the military. In the summer of 1943, men in New Hampshire were advised to sleep in the nude because there was a shortage of pajamas and underwear. But not everyone abided by the rules. For those who felt they deserved better and could afford it, there was the black market. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I oh, no. Yes. yes. There was a place coming home. We could stop in there, buy real butter, sugar, anything you wanted. No coupons. I don't want no coupons. Yes, you're all good soldiers, Mom. We know how you're going without things so as to buy just one more war stamp or one more bond. And you're not fooling me when you make exceptions for some of the other women in our town. There shouldn't be any exceptions. Just what does Mrs. Exception mean when she tells you she had to give up her Red Cross work because it didn't leave her time enough to get her hair done each week? And what does this Mrs. Exception mean by complaining about high prices and then boasting of all the stuff she bought on the black market? These aren't exceptions, Mom. They're only slackers. Remember, there aren't any exceptions out here, Mom. There can't be. Don't those women realize there can't be exceptions anywhere? That's a lot of baloney. Get going. Hiya, Joe. No, hiya. Is this the sheet of coupons you turned in last night? Why, you know it is, Mr. Clark. These three are counterfeit. This is the owner of the car with that number. Did he pass them on to you? He sure did. You may have to be a witness. All right, I'll tell you where I bought them. I got them from a guy that hangs around the plant by the name of Dixon. Okay. On the 4th of July weekend in 1943, 1,400 cars were stopped on their way to holiday outings in New Hampshire. Many had a letter from their doctor saying the trip was necessary for health reasons. Those who didn't found themselves subject to fines and loss of their gas ration stamps. During the winter months, ski areas were often checked by officials looking for people frivolously using gas. Even Governor Blood was called into question when seen driving on the outskirts of Concord with skis attached to the roof of his car. You would have to have a coupon, yeah. And if they didn't have coupons, you couldn't give up gas because we were lotted so much, and that was it. None of the boys had cars. Their older brother might have one. We had licenses, but not cars. Some could borrow their father's car. Some could borrow their brother's car. One time, we wanted to go chase some girls in a nearby town. We went to one of our buddies' farms. His father had a farm, and he had to, with extra gas rations. And in, in the dark of the night, we would go to the tractor and siphon gas out of the farm tractor for a so we could go cruising in the nearby town. Somebody throw a beer bottle out. You run over a bottle and you spoil a tire. You couldn't get them. 
He had a fellow, he had died, that belonged to the Masonic Lodge. And the guy that ran the funeral parlor was a brother. He came from Henneker. We had to take him from Warner to Franklin. You got old Blackwater Dam, go up over the hill, five inches of snow with ball tires. Did you ever try it? The guy that was acting as master of the lodge that night said, I've heard it pushing him into the grave, but he says, this is the first time I ever resisted. The nation's transportation system is doing a prodigious war job. On every highway and main line, war has the right of way. Remember, many of those in uniform may be going home for a last farewell. If you take a holiday trip, some serviceman or woman may not make it, and there will be an empty place at some family table, an empty feeling in some mother's heart. Everyone sacrificed, most by going without a trip to the beach, or sugar, or meat, or new stockings. For many, however, the sacrifice meant giving up a son, or two sons, or a husband, or a father. Though the degree of loss differed with each person, each family, the experience was universal. Everyone was going without. Everyone felt the pain of the moment. Everyone reached out a hand, offering help, support, friendship, and encouragement to endure. Because you couldn't just single yourself out, poor me, poor me thing. You could, all you had to think was there were people that were worse off than you. So you had to stop thinking of yourself and thinking of the whole, whole thing. I just think that people had a very caring, they had to care. That was what it was, you had to care. If you didn't care what was happening, then there was something the matter. And I can remember people saying, well, did you hear from, you know, say this one, or did you hear from Gordon today? Or did you hear from Norman today? Or did Junior write, you know, that type of thing. So it was, it was a very time, yes, people were together. We'll be going on tomorrow morning, Mom. Hank, Bill, Tony, all of us, with no exception. March behind us, Mom, and Mrs. Zabinski, and Mrs. Gallagher, and all of you. It's a big war. There's a place for everybody. We need you. March with us. Keep in step. Remember, you're in it. We're all in it, with no exception. This war does not and must not stop for one single instant. Our fighting men know that. Now, it is your turn. Every dollar that you invest in the third war loan is your personal message of defiance to our common enemies, to the ruthless savages of Germany and Japan. And it is your personal message of faith and good cheer to our allies and to all of the men at the front. God bless them. I know it was no sacrifice. We had a real good time. <laughs> yeah. Felt guilty, really. <laughs> what do you mean you felt guilty? Well, we were having a good time, and the guys had, had left and gone to service. They, they weren't. They weren't. <laughs> you thought about that when you'd have parties? Or yeah, dance? I think so. Yeah, because there were always close friends that were, that, that you know would have been there had they not been, had they not been in the service. And I do recall it on a couple of occasions having uh, just the most beautiful skiing I could possibly ask for, and it just didn't, it didn't feel good. I felt guilty because I didn't, my friends were overseas and this sort of thing, and I, and I knew how much they would enjoy it. Here I was having it all the better, but it wasn't as much fun. And you can't keep it up. I mean, it's like the horrible things going on in the world right now. You're much more conscious of now with television <coughs> or during Vietnam <coughs> that Americans were losing their lives. They're losing lives today in various crazy places. Uh, so uh, I think it's just life goes on no matter how bad things are until you're dead. 
The war that separated families and brought America rationing and blackouts also brought prosperity and riches. The manufacturing of planes, ships, tanks, and munitions brought jobs beyond imagination to an America still recovering from the Great Depression. 128 manufacturers in New Hampshire had contracts with the War Department. Those contracts brought jobs and paychecks. By the end of 1943, the average weekly wage had doubled over what it was in 1939. In March of 1944, savings accounts in New Hampshire increased by $1 million. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Back in them days, I used to walk down this street right here. And there were so many people on this street. And there used to be a line from the Strand Theater way up to the church on the hill when there was a movie playing. And you couldn't even walk on Main Street on the other side of the road with so many people. Every store was wide open. Business was just like that. State Street was a live place. Uh, we used to, you know, we always kid everybody that uh, those of us who stayed here bought the, fought the battle of State, State Street. There was probably more blood on State Street than there was anywhere else. You know, you get three or four beers, you know, and you get pretty anxious, you know, and the inner, inner service uh, competition, and, you know, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and uh, there, there could be a, a couple of lively evenings, you know. We had Marines, we had Army, we had Navy, we had Coast Guards. We had everybody here, you know. And the Air Corps at the time was the Army Air Corps. So we had every branch of the service here, and every unmarried person in the city was busy. And we were either over to the Navy Yard to a dance, or down to uh, down to Rye, down at Odeon's Point to a dance. We were we were at the here at the, at the uh, USO had a dance. We were everywhere. We were we were just thrilled with all of these people that were here and, you know, trying to make them feel at home. And I think the whole city became alive with all of the military, plus the fact that the Navy ad was on three, three sessions a day. The jobs brought vitality to America and to New Hampshire. Everyone was working. Everyone was helping win the war. From Coos to the sea, New Hampshire turned out products for the national defense. Paper in Berlin, ammunition crates in Nashua, bomb hoists in Claremont, gabardine for flying suits in Laconia, rifles in Keene, field jackets in Lebanon, submarines in Portsmouth, anti-torpedo nets in Concord, variable timing fuses in Dover, blankets for lifeboats in Tilton, and combat boots in Manchester. 90% of the in was women. There were sweethearts, there was husbands, there was brothers, there was sisters, there were the boyfriends. Just before they packed the shoes, some of them would slip in a note. My name is Mary, meet me at Blueberry Hill, I met your honey, and all of this, you know, made little love notes, little love notes. Beautiful, out of this world. We were all in it. And on top of that, I can remember distinctly, send Hitler, we're getting short of heels. One of the, one of the big problems was aircraft icing. When an airplane flies through clouds and the temperature's below freezing, the clouds stick to the airplane wing and cause them a bit of a problem. So they found that they could test sections of airplane wings on Mount Washington uh, a lot less expensively and a little more safely than doing it in an, in an aircraft. And we also had the uh, background meteorological information, temperature, wind, and so forth, so that the, the measurements meant something when, uh, when we took them. What sorts of problems would the war cause for your workforce? I guess it, Oh, they caused quite a bit of problems because here you'd break in a knitter and the next moment the knitter is called into service and breaking in the knitters was the hardest part. An unexpected problem was finding enough people to do the work. Education for the young took second place. High school students not old enough for military service went to work in war-related industry. In 1943, the New Hampshire legislature passed a bill to release from school all students 15 years of age or older to do war work. Between 1940 and 1944, the number of teenage workers in America increased by almost 2 million, while the number attending school fell by over 1 million.